Hello and welcome to a video field guide for beekeeping. I'm Jamie Ellis from the University of Florida's Honeybee Research and Extension Lab. Join me as today we discuss tracheal mites, the silent killer of honeybees in the United States. Tracheal mites were unknown prior to the 1920s. In the 1920s, there was this mysterious phenomenon that happened in the Isle of Wight off the coast of the UK. A professor there actually dissected bees and found tracheal mites for the first time, and he was the first to ever identify tracheal mites. Even though tracheal mites are no longer suspected in the deaths of bees in the Isle of Wight, that was the first recorded incidence of their presence. In 1984, they were found in the United States, and since that time, they've been responsible for the death of thousands of bee colonies across the U.S. Not only are they distributed in the United States, but their distribution is cosmopolitan throughout the world. They occur in most countries. It's important to understand that because of their presence almost everywhere in the U.S., beekeepers have them in their colonies, but they're not aware of them. And because of that, tracheomites are a silent killer. Foundational to understanding tracheomite pressures in bee colonies is understanding their biology. Tracheomite females actually get on the outside of bees, only bees though that are about one to two days old. The tracheomite female will move into the spiracle or opening of the thorax at the base of the bee's wings. That leads to a very robust tracheal system inside the thorax. The female mite will enter that spiracle, go into the tracheal system and begin to oviposit or lay eggs. Her offspring will mate in the tracheal system of the bee, and this leads to significant scar tissue forming in the tracheal system, as well as just clogged trachea due to the presence of large numbers of mites. After this has occurred, new females will come out of the tracheal system, or out of that spiracle on the thorax, and they'll begin to look for more bees that are one to two days old. Foundational to their movement from bee to bee is, is the fact that tracheal mites cue into the bee's smell. Now scientists call this smell cuticular hydrocarbons. It's simply the presence of these things on the cuticle of the bee. It creates this smell that tracheal mite females recognize and they know to jump from the bee that they're currently on to the bee that just walked by. After that mite is on that new bee, she'll begin the search for that spiracle at the base of the bee's wing, move into the tracheal system, and begin again. This entire process can take from about 15 to 20 different days. So when bee colonies are very crowded, tracheal mites are very able to move from bee to bee. Now let's discuss the symptomology associated with tracheal mites. Unfortunately, tracheal mite infestations can be very difficult to recognize. There are three primary symptoms associated with tracheal mite problems in your colonies. Two of those occur in the colony, one of those occurs outside the colony. It's important to remember that tracheal mite problems typically are at their peak in fall and winter. Keeping that in mind, you'll appreciate the first symptom, a disorganized cluster of bees. In fall and winter, when cooler temperatures arrive and bees are supposed to be clustering in order to keep warm, the presence of tracheal mites at high numbers can actually cause the bees to not cluster adequately. So on a cool day, when you go into the bee colony, the bees may be walking around and not clustered at all. So that is one symptom. The second symptom deals with the anatomy of the honeybee. You probably recall that bees have four wings, two wings on either side of the body. The front wing is connected to the second wing or hind wing on each side of the body by little hooks called hamuli. As such, when bees fly, those wings move in tandem. Well, in tracheal mite infestations, those wings can become unhooked and you can see disjointed wings or K-wing because when you look at a bee, the way the wings are, are spread out on the right side or the left side of the body, the bee looks like the letter K. The third symptom of tracheal mite infestations actually occurs here on the ground in front of the colonies. Bees heavily infested with tracheal mites will wander away 
from the nest and you can actually find them on the ground crawling up blades of grass in front of the colony. The problem with these symptoms are they're not unique to tracheal mites. Many different bee diseases and pests can cause any one of these symptoms. So the best way to diagnose your tracheal mite problem is to actually collect a sample of bees that you suspect have tracheal mites. It's best to collect a sample from the bees wandering around on the ground outside the colony because they're the ones most likely to have tracheal mites. You'll need to collect 50 to 100 bees, put them in a jar of alcohol, isopropyl or rubbing alcohol is okay, and send them to your local county extension office for identification. There the, the county agent or perhaps a bee scientist will dissect the bees and look for the presence of tracheal mites. <laughs> So what happens to that sample of bees that you send in to your county extension agent? Well, it's very likely that he or she is going to forward that sample over to a state apiarist like myself. In order to do the dissections properly though, we have to have the appropriate tools. First of all, we need a dissecting microscope. This dissecting microscope here has the ability to magnify things from 7 to 40 times. Typically though, we like to look at bees under the microscope for about 20 or 30 power when we're doing tracheal mite dissections. Second, you need two pairs of forceps. It's very important to note that these forceps have very small tips. Everything is larger under a dissecting microscope, so if you get a pair of regular forceps, the, tip, the tips are going to be far too big for you actually to be able to do any dissections. You do need two pairs because you will be working with both hands while you're dissecting your bee. Secondly, you need a little tray like the petri dish I have here that has some medium in the bottom that permits you to stick insect pins into. Here we just have a petri dish with beeswax that we melted to form the base. Notice the beeswax doesn't go all the way to the top of this petri dish because we're going to put the bees in here and flood this area with alcohol. So we want to make sure that there's some area on top of the wax that we can put alcohol. You'll also need some sort of improvised pinning device. This is simply a pencil that we broke in half and we stuck two tiny insect pins in the eraser. The two pins permit us to pin the bee down to the wax in the petri dish. If you only have one pin to pin the bee, as you're working with the bee, the bee is going to pivot around that pin and make it very difficult for you to keep the bee still. Finally, we have a container of alcohol. When you put the bees into your petri dish, you're going to flood that area with alcohol, not water. If you use water, there will be tiny bubbles that form all over the surface of the bee and make it very difficult for you to see. So we simply use alcohol. We put the bees in here, we flood the area, and that makes it where we can work with the bee a lot better. Now that you have the proper equipment, you can actually dissect your bees yourself. But in the event that you don't, let me just share with you exactly what happens as we receive your tracheal mite samples. First, we will remove about 10 to 20 of the bees that you sent us from the alcohol sample and put them on our petri dish or wax surface. Next, we will flood the petri dish with alcohol like I've discussed before to completely cover the bees. Once this has occurred, we will actually pick up one of your bees and grab her by her wings. Next, we'll use our forceps to remove the abdomen from the bee. This is actually a very important step because if you leave the abdomen on the bee, as you work with that bee under the microscope and you're pushing down that abdomen, honey or nectar can come up from the abdomen through the thorax and cloud your field of view. Once you remove the abdomen, take your insect pin and push it through the bee at about a 45 degree angle relative to the legs. After you've done this, you can take your bee and pin it into the wax medium in your petri dish. Next, take your forceps and looking through the microscope, remove the bee's head. Now usually the bee's head will come off with the front legs of the bee. This is important. If it does not, you'll actually have to go in there and remove the front pair of legs from the bee manually. Once you've done this, you can see a little bit of the white tissue that's on the inside of the bee. You're not finished though. 
you actually have to go and remove one more piece of the bee in order to adequately see what's going on inside of the bee's thorax. That piece is the collar, and it's a ring that runs around the perimeter of the thorax. You will grab that collar at the base of the thorax, arrowed in the diagram here, and use your forceps to pull the collar away from the thorax. You must remove this collar. You do not see enough of the tracheal system to diagnose the presence of tracheal mites while the collar remains on the bee. Also important to know is that that collar actually covers up the two spiracles on the bee's thorax where the tracheal mites first enter. So if you have a low tracheal mite infestation, tracheal mites will actually be under that ring and you can't see them. With a collar removed, you'll be able to see the tracheal mite system quite visibly. The tracheal system actually looks like the letter V turned upside down. If you look in this diagram here, you can see the trachea actually outlined. Healthy trachea are transparent. You can see through them. They're creamy in color. Low infestations to moderate infestations of tracheal mites appear as white globules present in the tracheal system. It's important to be able to distinguish these white globs from fat bodies that are also present in the thorax. At high infestations of tracheal mites, the tracheal mites actually cause scar tissue in the tracheal system like that arrowed in the trachea in this picture. The scar tissue uh, looks black. It can completely cover trachea. And if you see this, your trachea or your bee is present for tracheal mites. I recommend dissecting up to 16 different bees, and if you find no tracheal mites in any of these samples, then you have a 95% probability that you have no tracheal mites in the colony. If you, your bees have 10 to 20% infestation, then you need to treat your bee colonies. So now that we have adequately diagnosed tracheal mite problems in your bees, we're going to be going to the field soon to actually apply some controls. But prior to going to the field, one of the controls that we actually have to put in bee colonies requires a little bit of preparation first, and it is the grease patty. Grease patties are very important when trying to control tracheal mites, and they're really easy to make. You can make them one of two different ways. The first way is the more traditional way, where you use granulated sugar and solid vegetable shortening. You simply mix it three parts sugar by weight to one part vegetable shortening and you'll make a patty. I much prefer to use the second method for making grease patties where you use vegetable oil and powdered sugar. These products are easier to work with and they make a more consistent patty. To make a grease patty all you really need to do is you need to pour your vegetable oil into a mixer like we have here. This is a stand mixer. You pour the vegetable oil in and you add three parts sugar to the one part oil that you simply put there in the mixer. Important to remember is that you don't want your grease patties to be too liquid. You're going to apply them soon to bee colonies and you don't want it to, to run down between the frames of the colony. You want it rather to be more like a play-doh or a clay consistency. Now that your patty is mixed, you'll need to package it in a form that you can take it to your bee colonies. It's very simple to do. All you have to do is scoop out enough mixture that would make a pancake size patty. What you do is you put it between wax paper and sandwich the wax paper over the patty. You squeeze it down and this makes it possible for you to transport the patty from your kitchen to the field. So now that you understand the biology and the behavior of tracheal mites and diagnose whether or not you have a tracheal mite problem, now it's time to treat. Fortunately for the beekeeper, treating for tracheal mites is very easy. And in fact, you don't even have to use harsh chemicals to achieve near 100% control of tracheal mites. There are really three ways that you can control tracheal mites. The first of those doesn't even have to do with the treatment at all, but rather has to do with the queen that you use in your colony. For example, New World Carniolans, Russian queens, just to name a few, are very resistant to tracheal mites. So if you simply use these resistant stocks, you'll likely never have a tracheal mite problem. But if you elect not to use resistant stocks or fear that you have a tracheal mite problem regardless, there are two good controls that you can use inside the colony. 
both of those controls require you to get to the brood nest in the beehive. So let's go there on this particular colony. The two controls that we've already made up and discussed in the lab, we're going to use in our colonies now. Remember though, they both go on top of the brood nest. So in order to get there most effectively, you need to remove the queen excluder from the brood nest. With the queen excluder removed, you're now ready to put down the first of two possible control methods. The first is the grease patty. The grease patty we made a little bit earlier in the bee biology lab. This is just simply made up of powdered sugar and vegetable oil. You know, because we've discussed, that bees will consume this grease patty and the grease will get on their body. Because tracheal mites look for new bees because of the bee's cuticular hydrocarbons, this grease will mask that smell of bees and make it where tracheal mite females looking for a new host bee are unable to find one. So all you have to do to apply this grease patty is simply put it in the center over the top of your brood cluster and you can reassemble your colonies. As the bees consume this patty, they get the grease on their bodies and you achieve 95 to 100% control using this very non-chemical control approach. The second way to control tracheal mites by applying something in the colony requires your use of a chemical treatment. This particular chemical treatment is called menthol. And the label of menthol tells you that you have to use some minimum protective equipment to make sure that you don't have problems with this chemical yourself. The first piece of equipment are protective eyewear or goggles. And I'll put those on quickly. The second piece of equipment that you need to apply menthol are protective gloves so that when you handle the product, the product doesn't get on your hands. Menthol has obviously the active ingredient menthol in the product. It's very similar or identical in fact to the chemical that are in cough drops. It's just that the menthol that we use in bee colonies is extra concentrated. It is also very simple to apply, has very few side effects on bees, and therefore is a fairly good alternative to using grease patties. Menthols come in these netted packages now you should not remove the menthol chips from this net. The net holds it together and keeps the bees from removing it from the colony. To apply menthol, you simply put it on the nest in the middle of the colony and close your colony back. Simply to review, it's important to remember that you can achieve near perfect control of tracheal mites simply using resistant queens. So my first recommendation would be to go to that. Secondly, if you have a tracheal mite problem, you should address it using grease patties. Grease patties are a good non-chemical control and you can leave them on year round without worry or fear about contaminating your honey or hurting your bees. Should you feel though the need to use chemicals, you can use menthol if you have the proper protective equipment. But keep in mind, the label is the law anytime when you use a miticide. So it's important to follow the label instructions for applying menthol. It cannot be on colonies while your bees are bringing in marketable honey. If you follow these ways of controlling tracheal mites, you likely will never have a problem with tracheal mite in your colonies. Thank you for joining us today on a video field guide to beekeeping, controlling tracheal mites.